be safe to affirm that Joseph emerges as the most conspicuous in delineating a very pellucid profile of the life and times of Jesus the Christ. As we peruse his very dramatic biography, no great amount of cognitive skills is required to excavate those latent New Testament analogies found therein. For indelibly etched on every page, sketched on every chapter of Joseph's life, are imprints of salvation's story which dare not go unnoticed. From the timing of his birth in Canaan to his coffin in Egypt, the testimony of the Lord is sure. From being hated by his own without cause, only to be ostracized by wanton envy. Evidenced in his being the father's favorite son, wearing the very gated coat of honor. From being plunged into a pit of rejection, to one day be enticed by the spice of Mrs. Potterfire. And from this heat of temptation would come the seat of castigation within the prison house of affliction. And then to be raised up in the palace of exaltation. Jesus is seen everywhere. Almost every event of the life of this Old Testament character can be viewed as a prevision of the life of Jesus, his New Testament prototype. In fact, it might be safe to say that Joseph was led the way he was led in order that he might reveal the life of the one who made his living possible. I think I need to say that again. Joseph was led the way he was led in order that he might reveal the life of the one who made his living possible. If this is so, brothers and sisters, then the real dreamer in the story of Joseph is not really Joseph, but Jesus. It was Jesus who chose Joseph as a depository for his dreams. Way back then, I, I do believe Jesus reserved exclusive rights to broadcast his earthly mission in the form of dreams. And the chosen network was not 3ABN, but Joseph. Was not the Hope Channel, but Joseph. Joseph was the chosen network. Had it not been for Jesus, Joseph the dreamer would have been hallucinating. Therefore, I wish to see the dreams not merely as a preview of Christ's future mission, but if you like, these dreams, in my opinion, were but a review of a mission already accomplished in Christ. You see, you've, you've got to understand that the lamb was slain before Joseph was born. So the mission was completed long before Joseph had a dream. So when Joseph dreamed, it was confirmation that the mission of Christ was accomplished. As such, the sequel of events surrounding the life of this Old Testament character cannot be viewed or described as fortuitous. For every conflict, every trial, every vicissitude constituted part of a providential plot. A plot, in my opinion, that would be actuated by a coat of many colors. That's why I do believe that this checkered coat, worn by Joseph and woven into one, was actually designed by Jesus. For in Christ, different colors can come together. In Christ, different nations can come together. Help me somebody. In Christ, different races can come together. Even in Atlanta, Georgia, we are the coat of many colors. Help me somebody. For with Christ, discrimination is not an option and envy has no place. For the prodigious grace of Christ incorporates everyone and eliminates no one. Yet, this coat, while representing a coalescing of diversities, would soon become a source of animosity within this ancient home. For Joseph, wearing such a coat came not without expensive consequences. For the unbridled devotion shown to him by his father was not always shared by his siblings. 
he who would become the main beneficiary of his father's favor would soon become the main recipient of his brother's displeasure he who was blessed by his father was detested by his brothers and he was detested by his brothers because he was blessed by his father he who became the object of goodwill became the subject of ill will the lesson is obvious brothers and sisters be careful when god is good to you because not everybody will be excited Be careful when God blesses you. Not everybody would be excited. Should you look closely enough, Joseph challenges. Joseph challenges always seem to center around his dress code. Whatever he wore always seemed to get him into trouble. The same coat given to him by his father when he was alive, when he was alive, was the same coat given to the father as proof that Joseph was dead. The same garment that worked for him in Mr. Potiphar's house was used against him in Mrs. Potiphar's hand. All because of his dress code. First, he would be stripped of his coat and then put into a pit. Then he would be stripped of his garment and put into prison. All because of his dress code. You know, I have discovered that folk who are gifted or entrusted with positions of prominence usually become the target of two groups of people. The envious and the sensuous. And both groups will try to strip you. You are mighty quiet out there. Many a prominent minister can testify to this. For many who have been gifted and renowned have either been a threat to the envious or have been stripped by the sensuous. Stripped not only of their dignity but stripped of their portfolio as well but I thank God Joseph remained focused Joseph never lost sight of the purpose for which he existed though he was stripped in my opinion he was never naked for for underneath Underneath the many colored coat that he wore, underneath exhibit A in Mrs. Spot's hot little hand, Joseph wore another garment. It was a covering of integrity stitched together with dignity and woven together with his fidelity to God. Joseph wore another garment, stripped but not naked. Ultimately, God was intimately intertwined into his very being, guiding his steps every step of the way. And so Joseph remained resolute with iron in his soul and a tenacious faith in his God. The Bible describes, describes him as a goodly person. His reputation was that of a goodly person. He wore the pristine appearance of a goodly person, but I should warn you that the exquisite attire of an immaculate reputation is no guarantee of stability in the day of temptation. We need more than the outward appearance to guard our souls. Fellow ministers, our shirt and tie may be our uniform, but not our armor. You see, the truth is, our ministerial regalia would not always act as an, a deterrent against the sensuous. We can be held in high regard and still become a fallen prey, or worse yet, become a predator of the fallen. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 13 and verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I'm not hearing you in this place. Put on the Lord Jesus. That's the only guarantee we have in the day of temptation. Whether Joseph was in the pit 
or in the palace he remained focused and I declare to you whether your ministry finds you in the pit of things or in the presidential palace you need to put on Jesus that you will be able to stand somebody help me say amen in this place I want you to observe that God never gave Joseph a dream of what would happen to him in the pit his dream never involved what would happen to him in Mr. Potiphar's house or even in the prison. Joseph dreamed only of what will happen to him in the palace. Yet, he could not reach the palace if there was no prison. And there would not have been a prison without Mrs. Potiphar. And he would not have met Mr. Potiphar if he wasn't near a pit. Oh, Lord have mercy. This excites me. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you, brothers and sisters, is that the pit, Mr. Potiphar, Mrs. Potiphar, the prison house, were all part of the same dream to get Joseph promoted to the palace. He needed every part of the experience to get him to the palace. And what I'm trying to tell you this morning is that humility and humiliation are oftentimes the antecedent of greatness sometimes help me Jesus sometimes the path to the pinnacle is through the pit the cross always seems to precede the crown humility is an indispensable attribute of anyone who is striving for the palace and the cost of such humility will not be defrayed without the currency of pain and suffering. Yet the dream will not be fulfilled without it. Sometimes before you could be exalted, you must first be tried, tempted and tested, especially when the supervisor is not around. But I assure you that the trial and the temptation is part of the dream. Sometimes before you could be recognized, you must first be assigned a menial task. Sometimes you have to be denied that coveted position that you think you deserve. Sometimes pastor, in order to be recognized, you must first be confined to that intractable stiff neck district. But I assure you that the incarceration is part of the dream. Sometimes before your integrity can be authenticated, you need to be maligned and denigrated. But the impeachment is part of the dream. They are all part of the same script written and directed by a divine mind whose ways are past finding out. Therefore, I do believe that the whole account of the vagaries of Joseph's life is about God secretly working behind the scenes through Joseph and in spite of Joseph, but on behalf of all men. Like a secret service agent, God was carefully orchestrating the counsels of his own will. No wonder wherever Joseph could be found, he was blessing those around him because God was his secret service agent. <laughs> because of Joseph, his father's favor was disclosed while his brother's envy was exposed. Because of Joseph, Mr. Potiphar's trust was ignited while Mrs. Potiphar's lust was excited. Because of Joseph, a butler saw himself elevated while a baker saw himself eliminated. Because of Joseph, Egypt became a land of plenty while Canaan became a land of empty. Wherever Joseph went, he was blessed and wherever he could be found, he was blessing others. You see, it's not where you are or what you have, but who you have that determines how blessed you are. Help me somebody. It's who you have that determines how blessed you are. Huh? Potiphar's house was blessed because Joseph was there. The prison cell was blessed because Joseph was there. Pharaoh's palace was blessed because Joseph was there. You may not have everything that you need, but if you got Jesus, <laughs> you're blessed. You may not be where you should be, but if you got Jesus, help me somebody, you are blessed. 
And hear this one, you may not get elected. You may not get that promotion, but if you got Jesus, he will lift you up. Help me somebody. You are blessed. It's not where you are or what you have, but who you have that determines how blessed you are. Now, now see him here second in command. That day the Bible says when Joseph saw his brethren, he knew them. Is that Zebulun? Oh no. Look how big Issachar got. Oh no, that can't be Dan. Dan never wore beard. Oh look, 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 look. Naphtali. Oh my goodness. The Bible says he knew them, but they didn't recognize him. I guess by now because he was living in a strange land in a foreign place in an unexpected environment looking unfamiliar and speaking with an accent that was alien to them resonating with a repugnant tone they couldn't recognize him he was their brother in the flesh but a stranger a son of the soil yet a foreigner I suppose his entire persona was more odious than inviting. His demeanor denounced his pedigree. But he was their brother. But he was their brother in an unexpected place. <laughs> oh, this excites me. I'm going to get excited whether you get excited or not. You see, I'm always amazed by how God can hide his treasured blessings in unexpected places. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God can hide a reservoir in a dry rock. To let you know that even if you are in a dry place, God can still bless you. <laughs> oh Lord have mercy. God can get sweet water out of bitter waters to remind you that if you are going through a bitter experience God can still refresh you whole wheat manna can be prepared from a bakery in heaven God can disguise himself in our pillar of dark days and show up in our pillar of fiery trial a talking donkey can become a missionary Or a foreign evangelist a captive maid can help cure a captain Naaman a young girl can become God's chosen queen all because she was an orphan a, a, a woman's last meal during an economic meltdown can become her first meal in the hand of Elijah during her financial recovery. You're not hearing what I'm saying here, church. You're not hearing what I'm saying here today. I'm talking about a God who can hide his blessings in unexpected places. The people of God can get set free by the enemy of God called Cyrus. A wilderness can become a restaurant with just five loaves and two fishes. <laughs> Elijah can get clean meat from an unclean raven. And monetary tax can be found in the mouth of a fish. Oh, the unsearchable riches of God. His ways are past finding out. That's why you don't have to look like me in order for you to be my brother. Uh, you don't have to behave like me. You don't have to dress like me. You don't have to talk like me. Help me somebody. You can be from China. You can be from India. You can be from Germany. You can be from the Caribbean. You can be from Trinidad. You can be from Tobago. It doesn't matter. You don't have to look like me to be me or to be my brother because God can hide his blessings behind strange people as well they didn't recognize him but Joseph knew who they were but before he can reconcile himself with them he must first ensure that there are no remnants of enmity prevailing by now you would imagine 
that their conscience had been hibernating for the best of 20 years. Their callous hearts would have cloaked their frosty guilt, leaving them impervious to the heat of conviction. One of the dangers of unconfessed sin is that it can indurate us into a false sense of security. They had committed an evil to Joseph 20 years before, but their conscience had now been hibernating for 20 years. So wearing the disguise, in my opinion, is Joseph's way of getting an opportunity to cause them to examine their own hearts so that they will palliate their faults no longer. You see, brothers and sisters, sin doesn't only sever and separate. Sin also settles us into a spirit of apathy. I heard, Jeremiah, I heard God saying to Isaiah in Isaiah 59 and verse 1, It's not that I don't want to embrace you because my hands are not too short that they cannot save. It's not that I don't want to hear you because my ears are not too dull that they can't hear. But your sin settles you. And there is a third party between us. And you prefer the third party to me. So I can't embrace you if there is a third party between. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not that Joseph did not want to embrace his own but you must understand that reconciliation without repentance is meaningless. Sometimes, therefore, God must deal with us harshly. So the Bible says that Joseph spoke roughly unto them. Sometimes, in order to provoke our gagged conscience, God must deal harshly with them. Turn with me to the same chapter, and I want to illustrate this point here. In verse 24, the Bible says, And he turned himself about, that's Joseph, Genesis 42 and verse 24, And wept, and returned to them again, and communed with them, and took them from Simeon, and bound, and took from them Simeon, and bound them, and bound him before their eyes. I want you to imagine the scene. Joseph is now behind closed doors and he is weeping profusely because he's recognized that these are his brothers and he's overcome with emotion and he's weeping he's weeping and then when he's finally finished he composes himself wipes the tears from his eyes and goes back pretending he was all right and then he says now bind Simeon now you have to understand that when he said to them bind Simeon that act was a disguise because the true Joseph was here weeping but he put on the disguise in order to bind Simeon because this was strange to Joseph this attitude and this action and this behavior was strange to him but get this the Bible says they did not see Joseph weeping they only saw Joseph binding stay with me they saw him binding and if they only saw him binding they must have thought to themselves oh this governor is overcome with a sense of antipathy he is heartless he is insensitive why is he binding Simeon why is he doing such a cruel act to Simeon but little did they know that just before the binding there was a breaking of his heart and very often we only see the binding of God's hands but we do not see the bleeding of his heart and because we only see the binding we raise our finger and our fist to God asking him why did you do me such why am I going through this experience why are you binding me that's because we only experience the binding of his hands but we do not see the breaking of his heart in the midst of the binding, Joseph was falling apart. The lesson is, God never chastises us without himself feeling the pain. He never chastens us without tears in his voice. In the midst of the binding, his heart is breaking. And you must understand that though he spoke roughly to them, this was all a disguise. It was a dress code that did not befit his disposition. This is now not how he wanted to treat them. But he was seeking to cause them to repent. 
So he treats them roughly. Sometimes God must treat us harshly so that we can confront our own evil ways. But in the midst of all that he was doing, Joseph was still blessing them. Hmm. In spite of what they did to him 20 years before, he was still giving them corn. He even replenished their sacks. He even gave them perdium for their journey back home to Canaan. He was still blessing them. He had every right as governor to execute them, fought with. Yet, in spite of it all, Joseph invites them to sit with him in high places. Oh Lord, have mercy. They treated him as an outcast. But Joseph was not ashamed to call them brethren. They threw him, they threw him into a pit, yet Joseph invited them into his palace. They conspired to get rid of him, but Joseph was conspiring to reclaim them. They hated him without cause, yet Joseph showed them favor without measure. I don't know about you, but this sure reminds me of Jesus. He came down here seeking his own, when his own received him not. We gave him a manger for his delivery room and despicable Nazareth for his hometown. We discredited his claims as the son of God and accredited his works to that of Beelzebub. He gave rest to many and the only rest we gave him was a resting place on a rugged cross. Yes, an outcast he was amongst those who received him not yet in spite of how we treated him jesus never left us without a promise he said i go to prepare a place for you i don't know if you're hearing what i'm saying here today i go to prepare a place for you i know what you are going to do to me on the cross but i go to prepare a place for you that where you are and where I am would be together in heavenly places I don't know about you but I'm overcome by his love oh what matchless love I like the way the songwriter put it could we with ink the ocean fill or the skies of parchment made with every stalk on earth a quill or every man a scribe by trade to paint the love of God to man would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky oh what matchless love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God he wants to ravish us with his love and with his favor he wants to bless us with material things but far greater than material gifts jesus wants to bless us with the gift of himself he said if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your own children how much more will your heavenly father give you the holy spirit which is himself which means that the greatest gift god wants to give to us is himself that's why I believe, and I'm coming to a close now, when Joseph first saw his brothers, he never wanted them out of his sight in the first place. That's why he bound Simeon. He wanted to make sure they had insurance to return. Not only did he bind Simeon, but he told them, when you're coming back, make sure you bring Benjamin. Because this is going to be a family reunion. That's why I'm telling you my message is secret service. Joseph was secretly trying to reconcile himself with his brothers. That's why the second time, fearing that they may now go back home and never return, he surreptitiously planted his cup in Benjamin's sack. Mm -hmm. So now they were leaving with something belonging to Joseph. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Whenever you leave with something belonging to God, don't expect God to give up on you. Woo! 
Lord have mercy mm -mm -mm -mm. he made us in his image and though though Satan has tried to get rid of the image of God there is still a trace of the image of God in us left and once there is a trace surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives help me somebody God won't give up on us in spite of what we have done despite the fact we would mess up God won't give up on us I was curious. I looked up the word follow in that text. Surely his goodness and his mercy shall follow. And it means it will hunt. It will stalk us. It will pursue us. It will not just accompany us, but it will make sure it comes down into the ditch with us. Whenever it befall, his goodness and his mercy will still be there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Only when Benjamin, only when Benjamin carried the cup did the other brothers begin to confess. Only when Benjamin, whose name means son of the right hand, only when he, the innocent one, carried the cup. Because Benjamin wasn't around when Joseph was put into the pit. So if there's anyone who was innocent, it was Benjamin. Yet Joseph put his cup in the innocent sack. And because the innocent carried a cup he should not have carried, the others confessed. I don't have time. I don't have time to talk about all of that. I don't have time. Because the son of the right hand carried the cup. Those who were guilty began to confess. And alas, as alas, when confession constrained them con to confess, Joseph's volcanic emotion would finally erupt he could not refrain any longer cause every man to go out from me he said get them out get them out because what i'm about to do with myself and my brothers is a private matter god is a god of secret service <laughs> you see god is smart God knows who you are is really who you are when no one else but Jesus is around. God knows our devotion to him is not measured by our deportment in public. It's what we do behind closed doors that matters so cause every man to go out there's coming a time and there should be a time in your experience when you and Jesus must meet alone cause every man to go out and there is where joseph declared god set me before you to save you by a great deliverance to save you by a great deliverance i didn't come here to give you grain i came here to save you i like the way joseph put it god sent me ahead of you to save you by a great deliverance you see the our greatest need is always going to be salvation if, 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 if our greatest need was education, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been communication, the word would not have become flesh. It would have been text or email. If, if our greatest need had been recognition, God would have put us on his Facebook. But our greatest need is salvation. So God sent us a savior. And he sent us a savior in spite of who we are. He sent us a savior to let us know that in spite of what you go through, I will be there. Here's where I close. Joseph said, God sent me ahead of you because God is always ahead of us. His grace is always ahead of us. His mercy is always ahead of us. Before I call, he will answer ahead of me. Before I go into sin, his lamb is already slain ahead of me. Before I go into the far country, the calf is already being fattening ahead of me. Before for I have a need, he's already provided ahead of me. He's always a God ahead of me because he's an awesome God. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. I may not know how, but I don't always have to know how as long as I get to know him and I know that he is able. He is the God of secret service. He can work in the night as well as in the light. So you hold on my brother, the God that will take you through through the night will help you see the light you may not know how but you don't have to know how as long as you know that he is a god of secret 
service.